2020 was a difficult year for all of us, including the Doom Patrol, whose sophomore season was cut short before the finale. Season 2 mainly adapts characters and stories from writers Drake and Haney, Paul Kupperberg, and Grant Morrison. However, we would be remiss if we didn't give a shout out to writers Rachel Pollock and Gerard Way, whose work also makes its way into the show. And what a show it is, turning up the weird while grounding it in themes of family trauma and growing up. We're about to get into spoilers, so if you haven't watched Season 2, we suggest you go ahead and binge that now. Otherwise, click your heels together and repeat after me, what's the difference? Uh, guys, I'm gonna suggest maybe we deal with the issue at hand here and then meet the world's most powerful little girl. Season 2 picks up right where Season 1 left off, with the Doom Patrol miniaturized after a rescue mission to save Danny and a new character to the show, Dorothy. I heard that. It was Kupperberg who created Dorothy Spinner as your average girl who just happens to have a face like an ape. But it was Morrison who granted Dorothy the power to manifest her imaginary friends in reality. Unlike the comic, the show writes Dorothy as the love child of Niles Calder and his magical Neanderthal lover. She possesses the same reality-altering powers as her comic book counterpart, but the show recontextualizes them by making two important characters an inheritance from her mother, which leads us to the primary theme of season two. She's a mommy. Season 1 took the most liberties when generating the backstories to their traumatized heroes. Season 2 continues in that vein, but hyper-focuses on the trauma they inherit from family. Many of the arcs are unique to the show. Rita confronts her mother's impossible standards. Cliff attempts to reconnect with his daughter. Larry grapples with his parenting missteps. Jane falls out of favor with the family inside her mind. Vic finds himself heartbroken after his newfound girlfriend flaunts questionable morals. But the drama between Niles Calder and his daughter Dorothy is at the center of season two, and draws plenty of inspiration directly from the comics. The Immortus Project is working. Rita Farr has shown zero signs of aging since 1955. The first season introduced Calder's mission of extending his life, but season two is where we see his fierce paternal instincts as the motivation. Dorothy needs to be kept safe. It's a clever adaptation of the comic, which has Calder search for prolonged life not as a central plot, but as a backstory that lands Calder in a wheelchair. Ooh, ouch. The show adapts many comic book storylines to fit the mold of Calder's immortality pursuit. For instance, in the show, Calder is asked to become the ward of Red Jack, a paranormal sadist who feeds off the pain of others. In return, Calder would be given the immortality he seeks. Calder shows real personal growth when he forgoes the easy route and kills Red Jack instead. In the comics, Red Jack seeks a wife and the comatose member of the Doom Patrol, Rhea Jones. And while Rhea wakes up long enough to stab Jack, it's Jane who ultimately defeats him by freeing the countless suffering butterflies in Jack's home. Another victim of Calder's mission for immortality is Dr. Time. That's how it's spelled. Okay. In the show, he's a time-hopping disco freak with an affinity for collecting people for his never-ending roller rink party. The Doom Patrol is sent to procure a time-manipulating material from his helmet, which just turns out to be his head in what becomes a hilariously botched heist-turned-accidental assassination. I thought it was a helmet! <laughs> Comic book Dr. Time is nothing short of a petty thief who uses his time ray to steal jewels and cash. It's pretty pathetic. The final victims of Calder's quest are the crew of the pioneers of the Uncharted, most notably Valentina Vostok, aka Negative Woman. The Russian one! In Paul Kupperberg's revival, the negative spirit departs Trainer to find a new host in Valentina Vostok, who finds a harmony with the entity that allows her to maintain control of the negative projection. When Trainer returns to the Doom Patrol, animosity grows between him and Val over the custody of the negative spirit. Did you see Kramer vs. Kramer? What makes you so sure he wants you? What makes you so sure he doesn't want me? The show writes Valentina as a member of Calder's forgotten space mission to research the negative spirit. She and Larry have a cordial exchange, and while Larry finds hope in her peaceful coexistence with the spirit, he also discovers a warning in her loss of humanity. Any last words? If ever any fruit grows here, don't eat it. The tattered lives of Jack, Val, and Dr. Time shows us that Calder will stop at nothing to protect his daughter. <laughs> But no father-daughter drama would be complete without the fear of their little girl growing up. Like Dorothy of Oz, Dorothy of Doom is on a coming-of-age journey in both mediums. The show, however, uses her transition into womanhood to manifest the season's primary antagonist, the Candlemaker. 
In the comic, the Candlemaker is an interdimensional creature who uses Dorothy as a doorway into our reality by tempting her with deadly wishes when she's at her most vulnerable. First, when she's bullied in her hometown, second, when the Avatar threatens her in the ant farm, and lastly, during Chief's betrayal. But the show adapts the Candlemaker as a rite of passage inherited from Dorothy's mother. The wishes he grants are just as deadly as in the comic book, but the situations differ. The first wish murders a tent full of people during an abusive freak show, which is conveniently when Calder finds his daughter in the first place. In Finger Patrol, Dorothy becomes frustrated with Baby Doll's childish behavior, which in turn results in the Candlemaker murdering Baby Doll and flaming Katie. This departure from the comics not only plays into Dorothy's progression away from childish things, but it also serves as a plot point for Jane, Miranda's return from the well. The one and only. So while the comic treats the Candlemaker's wishes as a three strikes and he's free to destroy the world sort of thing, the show makes it seem like his emergence is inevitable, that it's tied to Dorothy's age. And with that, it's time to talk about those red shoes. In the comic, Dorothy's seemingly menacing imaginary friends attempt to force her to wear ruby slippers as a not-so-subtle metaphor for her first period. Naturally, she resists this, holding on to her childhood with a Peter Pan-like grip. The show adapts the shoes to fit their narrative of inheritance. Rather than ruby slippers pushed by Dorothy's friends, it's her mother who offers red boots to Dorothy, signifying a tribal rite of passage that includes a confrontation with the Candlemaker, as her mother presumably did before her. And so, the show pits Calder's paternal search for immortality against Dorothy's inevitable steps towards adulthood that results in a clash of strange and tragedy, culminating in a cliffhanger that leaves the Doom Patrol seemingly lost to graves of wax. It's a dire situation that has its roots in Morrison's run, which feels more permanent than the violence in the show. Of course, it being a comic book, most of the heroes return from death in various outlandish ways. Jane's situation is altered the most, since she doesn't have a confrontation with the Candlemaker at all in the show. Instead, the writers create an entirely new plotline for Jane, fueled by an old primary named Miranda. Didn't you jump into a well? I did. Through flashbacks, we see Miranda betrayed by love, which leads her to end her life at the well, only to be used as a disguise for Jane's evil father. Sweet baby. It's a wild left turn from the comics. Instead, Miranda is assaulted by a total stranger, triggering memories of her childhood abuse. Like the show, she ends her life at the well, however, Miranda is never seen again. And while the Candlemaker sends Jane to an alternate reality in the comic, the show has Miranda throw her down a well, amongst the other murdered personalities. It's perhaps a more gruesome adaptation of Gerard Way's story arc, in which Dr. Harrison attempts to be the last personality standing. Thankfully, the good doctor wears the proverbial white hat in the show. Think of it as a performance improvement plan. Once season three reveals if our heroes are able to cheat death, we'll find out just how different their resurrections are from the source material. But until then, I say we party. The events of season one left Danny the Street shrunken down to Danny the Brick. Nice try, Danny. By episode four, Danny is nurtured back to health, resulting in Danny the Wheel. These forms of Danny are derived from the 2016 run of Gerard Way, wherein Danny reduces himself to a brick and travels the universe. Later, Danny takes the form of an ambulance, which is possibly what the show is alluding to with Danny the Wheel. <sighs> During Danny's party in episode four, the show introduces a sex demon by the name of Shadowy Mr. Evans, who shows up when Flex and Rita engage in some bedroom therapy. All right, everyone take three steps back and keep your hands where we can see them. The sex men arrive to wrangle some sexual poltergeists and help stop Shadowy Mr. Evans before he plunges the world into a hedonistic hellscape. In Morrison's run, shadowy Mr. Evans claims to be Satan himself, who periodically returns to Earth in order to break the shackles of oppression by projecting intense sexual fantasies on humanity, including Cliff in a send-up of the X-Men, a property considered by some to have plagiarized the original Doom Patrol. The show chooses to parody the Ghostbusters with their depiction of the Sexmen as paranormal exterminators. However, it's Jane's personality, Hammerhead, who saves the day. We'll take it from here. The sex men are just as inconsequential in the comics. In the end, Cliff tricks Evans into crooning some magical words that send him back to his plane of existence, leaving Jane's Scarlet Harlot personality to soak up the residual sexual energy. Man, that is weird. And thankfully, the show took full advantage of the comics' weirdness to not only freak us out, but to enhance their themes of growing up and family trauma. It was a fantastic follow-up season to a show that continues to make wonderful decisions in the adaptation, and we can't wait for season three to bring more interpretations of the beloved comic book series. Hey, Jake, do I get the f out of here? Yeah.